uh, to talk about the programs offered in New York for homeowners so that we can go green. And um, so much of what we're doing tonight is trying to make sure that we have some tools in place. Uh, for us all to work with. I know that Michael Leonard, who is way back here, is a councilman in Phillipstown. He's joined us tonight. And I know that Phillipstown is working on a lot of different um, programs um, within the community. Um, we're going to ask each of our panelists to speak and take questions from the audience. Uh, but on each of your seats, there is an index card. And we do have pens, if you need a pen. And we're asking you to write your questions uh, to the panelists and then hand them to Andrew in the back and Maddie in the back or Jen up front um, and, um, and so that we can hear what your questions are. We'll bring them to the uh, panelists. And then uh, we've had a lot of wonderful co-sponsors for this meeting and we're going to ask them uh, to come up at the very end and tell us about what their organizations are doing, and um, that would be very helpful. So um, let's begin our evening, and with Shandu, if you would like to, he's going to go over here. You're going to find people back and forth between our panels. to Assembly Women's Andy Galef and to Mandy Joel for this uh, invitation to speak here. Some of you might have noticed that it's a little cold outside, which, believe it or not, is absolute proof that uh, the poles are warming faster than anywhere else, and that's actually why it's cold here. If anybody wants to understand that better, we'll save it for Q&A. So, my job, is to set the stage for this evening by summarizing the 48th report of the IPCC. And before I start, I will just say that my talk is all about the science. This is not political in any way. I'm just representing the science that's in that report. So let's just jump right into it. <coughs> by way of background, what is the IPCC? The IPCC, can you hear me properly in the back? Sounds a little strange to me here. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's the United Nations body that is tasked with understanding climate science. This body released a new report in October of 2018, and that's the subject of my presentation. Make no mistake about it, IPCC sets the gold standard for scientific reports. These are thoroughly peer-reviewed, 91 scientists from 40 countries collaborating, 6,000 cited references, 42,000 comments and reviews. This is very rigorous stuff, and frankly, written in a very pedantic style. So my job is to interpret that in a little bit of lay person language. By way of background, many of you are aware that the Paris Accord set a limit of 2 degrees centigrade for global warming, where the goal is to limit our warming to 2 degrees centigrade. What many of you may not know is that the Paris Accord had a stretch goal of 1.5 degrees, and the island nations that are most worried about sea rise insisted at the time of the Paris Accord that there be a follow-on study by the United Nations on what would be the impact of global warming that is more than 1.5 degrees centigrade. These island nations were Nauru, Kiribati, and the Marshall Islands, and they got their way. So, after the Paris Accord was finished, a new study started on 1.5 degrees of warming, and that is the IPCC report that we will be discussing. For the purposes of this report, the term overshoot refers to exceeding 1.5 degrees centigrade of global warming. 
What I'm going to do now is to give you an executive summary of this report. The report is about 730 pages long. It has cross-references, citations, graphs, tables, histograms, and it falls to me to summarize this in one page with large font. <laughs> and this is what I'm going to try to do. And I'm going to try to do this in a very simple Q&A format. Question one. When will global warming reach 1.5 degrees centigrade? And the answer to this one is pretty straightforward, it's undisputed. If we do nothing, it'll be around the year 2035. We have already warmed about 1.2 degrees centigrade relative to the pre-industrial era, which is the average between 1850 and 1900. We're continuing to warm at 0.2 degrees centigrade per decade, so it's about a decade and a half before we hit the 1.5 degree. That's an easy one to answer. Question two. What are the risks of overshoot? Mind you, overshoot means that we exceed 1.5 degrees. This is one of the most important aspects of this report. What it tells us is that the danger in the overshoot is more dire than anybody imagined before this report. The kind of language they use is elevated risk of irreversible damage. We all understand that extreme weather is one outcome of climate change. We all understand that rising seas, melting glaciers, these are all aspects of, of climate change. But some of the most profound impacts of climate change are in the oceans. The oceans have been doing an amazing job absorbing all the CO2 that we put into the air year after year after year. In case you're wondering how much CO2 we put up into the air, it's 40 billion metric tons of CO2. All that coal we burn, all that gas that we burn, all that petrol that we burn is producing 40 billion metric tons. And for those who like pounds, that's 88 trillion pounds, 88 trillion pounds per year. Now all this CO2 going into the oceans is causing an even more profound impact. The oceans are getting acidified. That acidity is attacking the coral reefs and basically destroying the coral reefs. The patterns of circulation in the ocean are changing, which leads to much more intensive weather events on land. All of these effects uh, also lead to flooding. So we have glaciers that are melting, we have water that is warming and therefore expanding, and this is leading to coastal flooding. None of this is new, but what the report tells us is that the consequences are more dire. And more importantly, the report tells us that there are certain tipping points in nature, whereby if we pass that tipping point, there will be some positive feedback in the loop. In other words, this warming will gallop away on its own, and we will be powerless to stop it. So in some sense, we're rolling the dice and gambling if we exceed 1.5 degrees of warming. And life as we know it on this planet could change very rapidly and for the worse if we take this gamble. Question three, can we prevent overshoot? And the answer, according to this report, is yes, we can prevent overshoot. And there are really two parts to it. There's the CO2, and then there's the so-called non-CO2 greenhouse gases, two classes of gases. On the CO2 portion of the puzzle, what we need to do is to rapidly drive down the rate at which we're burning fossil fuels so that we emit less CO2. And the report is very prescriptive that we have to reduce our CO2 emission by 50% by the year 2030. Everybody, take a deep breath and think about what this means. The CO2 emission should be cut in half by the year 2030. And we should get to net zero by the year 2040. Now, 
just attacking CO2 is 77% of the problem. The other 23% of the problem are non-CO2 greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide and fluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons and so on. And so the way we do our agriculture, forestry, and land use has to be modified in order to solve the other 23% of the problem. And we have to do this urgently. Last question here. Is there any good news in this? Sounds pretty dire, right? And the answer is yes, there is good news in this. Point number one, we have the technology to solve these problems. We have solar panels and wind turbines to produce electricity. We know how to build electric vehicles that can run on clean electricity. We know how to build heat pumps for our heating and cooling. We know what we need to do in terms of land use and compost and waste and so on. So we have the solutions available to us and the best news is that for the first time in decades, economics is on our side. The cheapest way of producing a unit of electricity anywhere in the world today is either wind or solar. It's not coal, it's not gas, it's not nuclear. It's wind or solar. So economics is on our side and we have the technology. We need the will and the financing in some cases to really adopt these solutions and push them along very, very quickly. The other thing the report makes very clear is that there is a solid and tight synergy between preventing overshoot on the one hand and United Nations Sustainable Development Goals on the other. So what are these SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals? It's stuff like ending hunger, ending poverty, gender equality, clean air, clean water, and so on and so forth. And so basically, it's not very surprising that the conclusion is what's good for the planet is good for its residents. And in fact, it's good for all the species on the planet. So there was my one page attempt at summarizing it. I'm going to show you a couple of quick graphs to back this up and then hopefully stay within my 12 minute limit here. <laughs> so, very quickly here, this chart on the vertical axis shows the amount of warming. It's basically the average temperature of the globe. It's the body temperature of this Earth that we live on. The horizontal axis goes from 1960 to the year 2100, the end of this century. The orange portion is the stuff we already know, and the dotted orange line tells us that we will reach that 1.5 degree line by 2035. You see three different shapes on top. Those are called plumes. Plumes are nothing but families of outcomes from different scenarios. And so what the IPCC scientists did was to study three different scenarios and they plotted all the probable outcomes from these scenarios. And what you should be looking at is a line that's in the middle of these plumes because that's the most likely outcome of each of these plumes. So stated very simply, the blue scenario here is the only one that minimizes the chance of overshoot. Because that dotted line in the middle of the plume kisses the 1.5 degree centigrade line roughly mid-century and then backs off. But at the end of the century, we still will not have cooled to the temperature we are at today. So we're going to warm for some more time and then back off on that. So what is this blue scenario? The blue scenario assumes that we drive carbon dioxide to zero by 2040, and that we hold non-carbon dioxide emissions flat. In other words, we stop increasing the non-CO2 emissions. That's the only scenario that minimizes the chances of overshoot. This picture, it's a little hard for you to see in the back, so I'll describe it, is one of my favorites from all of those 730 pages. On the vertical axis here is the amount of CO2 that we emit every single year. And we're today at about 40 billion tons. 
Every line in this chart is a pathway of reducing our emissions. All of the great pathways fail to prevent overshoot, and all of the aqua-colored pathways are successful in preventing overshoot. So what is the attribute of all those pathways that are successful? The simple answer is they all achieve a 50% reduction by the year 2030. In other words, there's no time to wait. There's no wiggle room. We gotta get going now. If you wait till 2030 and then have very aggressive reductions, it's too late. Certain tipping points will have been achieved by that. So this really tells us the urgency of the decade that's in front of us. <coughs> Last one here. I'm not going to read through any of this, but you might wonder, well, Paris said two degrees. I read in the popular press that we may warm five degrees and six degrees, and I help us. Right? What's, what's all this fuss about 1.5? So this table tells you the additional danger of two degrees of warming over and above 1.5. And what I would call to your attention is that just the coastal flooding would be 10 million additional people being displaced. This is being called the sixth great extinction. The last one was 40 million years ago when the dinosaurs died. We're losing species at an incredible rate. Arctic ice in the summer will disappear once per decade instead of once per century if we have two degrees of warming instead of 1.5. And in terms of livestock, poverty, people, migration, the, the, just the, the consequences are unimaginable in, in, in the several hundred million people negatively affected. This is a future that we must find a way to avoid. I want to take a moment to mention something that we're doing right in this area to fight climate change. This is a not-for-profit called Croton 100. This is trying to get Croton to be 100% emission-free by the year 2040 by reducing our emissions 5% per year for the next 20 years. The way it will work is neighbors influencing neighbors on choices of car, choices of furnace, choices of diet, choices of community solar, and so on and so forth. It's for education and influence amongst the community, amongst the neighbors. And I would invite you to visit croton100.org. If you feel so moved, take the pledge, talk to us, volunteer, donate. We need all the help that we can get. I'm going to end with a quote. This quote accompanied the press release when the IPCC report came out. And it says, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. So I ask everybody in this room, on a personal level, are you taking rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes? On a professional level, are you taking rapid, far-reaching, unprecedented changes? At a community and politics level, are you taking rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes? Please ask yourself these questions. Thank you. that they built. Uh, that's so impressive. And uh, you know, you've really followed through on, on what you believe, and that's tremendous. Um, now I'm going to reach out to the three of my three other panelists who have actually come from Albany today, although they're not always in Albany, but um, and I want to first have uh, Connor um, talk about um, our, our what we did in Albany this year and how it's going to work and uh, where we go kind of on a, a macro level after hearing what our needs are. Sorry. 
Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, so, my name is Connor Gremberg. I'm the Air and Energy Director for Environmental Advocates of New York. Um, environmental <coughs> Advocates is now uh, in its 50th year, uh, we're based in Albany, uh, and we play the role of sort of environmental watchdog in Albany, weighing in on uh, any number of issues. It's my responsibility is to cover uh, air, energy, environment, uh, clean energy issues, but we also have a water resources team and, and a community team as well. Um, but I'm here today, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, work that we've done in coalition uh, over the past four years, uh, and then some new exciting work we're doing uh, around electric vehicles. So uh, EA is one of the founding members of the NY Renews Coalition. Uh, Um, so the NY Renews Coalition came together uh, about four years ago um, with the goal of changing the climate debate, bringing new voices to it. Is that better? Uh, thank you. Um, we uh, came together with the goal of sort of changing the debate, uh, bringing the voices to the table that we felt had been missing uh, in the previous years. So we formed a coalition that is close to 200 organizations now, uh, and we brought in voices from the labor movement, we brought in voices from community-based organizations, faith-based, environmental justice, uh, organizations working in communities of color, and we worked together around a set of core principles about where we'd like to see New York go, and then we took a stab at drafting a piece of legislation. Uh, and then from there, we went to our allies in the assembly, who had always been very strong on climate clean energy issues. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and we asked if they would partner with us on, on this bill we were calling the Climate Community Protection Act. Uh, and over the past four years, we worked very closely with the assembly. The assembly has passed the bill each of those years, uh, and a few different times tried to insert it into the budget debate as well. Um, this year, uh, everything sort of changed. Uh, elections have consequences. Uh, the new leadership in the state senate opened the door to finally get this legislation across the finish line. Uh, and I won't go into the details of the bill now. We have to leave that up to Mark. Uh, but um, skip ahead, please, the next slide. On July 18th, uh, the governor signed what is now being called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And what this bill is going to do is essentially transition us off of fossil fuels uh, in the next 30 years. Um, as I said, Mark is going to get into the, the details of the legislation and the implementation, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and, and as Sandy mentioned earlier, uh, when we get back into, uh, into January, uh, we're going to, uh, in, in, into Albany in January, we're going to look to do that work. And, uh, NY Renews has sort of followed up uh, the passage of that bill by asking the governor to uh, dedicate a new climate fund in this upcoming state budget. Uh, and we're asking for at least $1 billion to be dedicated to that fund. I'm sorry, to I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but just so that we understand the context going forward, when you say us going to zero, what exactly is that the definition of us? Is it just the state government? Is it? No, it's uh, eliminating the use of, of, of fossil fuels in, within New York State. Level, the, the community economy level, level, economy wide, across right. the board. So 100% renewable electricity, a transportation sector powered by that renewable electricity, and uh, uh, renewable sources can be our peer buildings as well. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we're asking for a climate implementation fund in the coming, uh, in the coming budget. And uh, I want to transition to some of this other work that we're doing now on the local level to help out in terms of implementation. And that's through a new coalition that we're calling Electrify NY. I see one of our partners in the coalition, Sustainable Westchester, in the back there. Um, and here the thinking is, okay, now we have this great new law in place. Let's look around and see you know, how it can now be implemented. Uh, and uh, we looked at all the different areas, the renewable electricity uh, area is, is pretty well covered here in the state. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to hear a little bit about uh, uh, energy efficiency solutions uh, that can be taken for buildings. 
Uh, but the transportation sector is really just wide open. Uh, and our goal is to work with municipalities to have them lead by example uh, when it comes to the electrifying uh, the transportation sector. Uh, so we set out a goal of having all electric public transit fleets statewide by the year 2040. Uh, state policies and resources to help transition those fleets. So part of that dedicated climate fund going to municipalities to help them transfer their own vehicle fleets to electric vehicles and to invest in the infrastructure that's needed in the communities to help community members also make that transition. So the big thing with transportation is that that is our largest collective source of carbon emissions here uh, in New York, around 35%. Um, there are, I think, somewhere in the area of 11.7 vehicles registered here in New York State. Those vehicles are either going to have to be, uh, well, the number of those vehicles are either going to have to be reduced and they're all going to have to be replaced uh, with, uh, in our view, uh, electric models if we're going to actually meet our goal. Uh, right now, we're in a spot where there's roughly 50,000 electric vehicles on the road here in New York State. Uh, so we got a long ways to go. As I said, uh, we're looking to have local governments lead by example. We're working uh, here in Westchester, we're working on Long Island uh, to, to get uh, municipalities to adopt ordinances committing to a transition um, and committing to making the investments in the infrastructure I spoke about earlier. And to that end, we've created what we're calling our Municipal Toolkit. You can check it out on the Electrify NY website. Um, it's a living, dynamic document that we have up on that website, we're constantly updating it with examples of what municipalities across the country are doing uh, when it comes to promoting electric vehicles. Um, so the next couple of slides, I'll just quickly run through a number of these examples and then uh, turn it over to Mark. Uh, so what we're asking communities to do is sort of take that first step uh, and do a comprehensive assessment of their government fleet uh, and to come up with a plan uh, that year by year as vehicles start to retire, how they can be replaced uh, with electric vehicles and what kinds of infrastructure needs uh, the municipalities are going to have to uh, invest in in order to maintain that fleet. So when I say infrastructure needs, I'm talking about charging stations essentially. Uh, and then we're asking them to, to make that clean fleet commitment, uh, to actually formally commit to uh, transitioning uh, their fleet uh, to full electric by the year 2040. Um, uh, we're starting to see some progress uh, around that municipalities on, on Long Island and, and here in Westchester. Uh, we're asking uh, municipalities to look into aggregate purchasing and shared services to work together um, as, as they make this transition. Uh, and with that, we have examples of the, the uh, vehicle marketplace that's run by the state's Office of General Services, where you can submit requests uh, for, for bids uh, for very specific uh, to, to what type of vehicle you might like, uh, you know, what type of electric vehicle you're looking for. There's also the Climate Mayor's Electric Vehicle Purchasing Collaborative. These are mayors from across the country that are, that are trying to do the same thing to take advantage of these economies of scale. Um, another key to it, as I mentioned, is EV charging infrastructure. Now, as a, a lot of folks, as they, uh, a lot of households, as they now transition and take on electric vehicles, most of they're going to be charging at home. Uh, electric vehicles these days are coming in with ranges anywhere from 200 to uh, over 300 miles per charge. Uh, so uh, they're not going to really be that much of a need to have charging stations all over the communities. But for uh, Households that don't live in a single family household, that are multi family households, or, or lower income households, might not have access uh, to, to clean vehicles. So, this is where we believe municipalities can play a big role in making sure that that access to the EV charging infrastructure and other clean vehicle alternatives are there for those members of the community. Uh, finally, uh, we're pointing out uh, different best practices uh, that are out there, and ICERTA has compiled uh, a number of those for municipalities to rely on for different actions they can take to 
uh, promote uh, EVs in their communities. Uh, things like EV-ready building codes, for example. Uh, uh, all new construction uh, be put forth in a manner that could take on uh, in an electric vehicle and, and, and charging infrastructure if that time eventually came. Uh, parking policies, uh, creating favorable spots for uh, for electric vehicles, making sure that parking structures are also EV ready to take on charging stations, um, and um, other various incentives to to encourage the, the uptake of, of EVs in the community. Um, again, public access to charging infrastructure, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, municipalities can play a big role there through uh, property tax exemptions or making sure that there's publicly accessible chargers on government property. Uh, and then finally, education and awareness. Uh, making sure that people are, uh, are aware that the technology's out there, it's accessible, the costs are coming down, uh, making sure that they have access to uh, you know, the various cost comparison tools that are out there. Again, you know, Nexer has a, a great cost comparison tool where you can look at uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle and compare it to an electric vehicle and it'll lay out uh, you know, all the savings and at which point uh, uh, you know, in terms of fuel savings, maintenance costs, things of that nature. Uh, so you get a good idea about what you're getting into when you, when you get into a Navy. And I will pause with that and thank you very much. Thank you so much. to encourage our municipalities um, to do a lot within the community. And that's going to take people going to municipal meetings and talking about these things and, you know, getting, I don't know, you know, solar on the roof and things like that. Um, so we've given this wonderful challenge and information to go get from the website. So now we're going to turn to my Mark Lowry and uh, my panelists were so great, they coordinated everything that they were doing, even their slides. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, Mark is from the Department of Environmental Conservation and uh, Assistant Director of the DEC's Office of Climate Change. How long have you been doing that, the Climate Change Office? The Office of Climate Change was formed in 2007. Uh, with then Governor Spitzer's executive budget, um, I am the last of the original Office of Climate Change staff left. Everyone else has retired, moved on, been promoted. I'm the last one still there. Is your microphone on? Um, looks like it is. There, how's that? Okay, don't make me repeat what I just said about myself. Um, the Office of Climate Change currently comprises nine staff, eight professional level staff, and the secretary. And our role, our job is to coordinate New York State's response to climate change, both in terms of mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to the effects of climate change. We do not by any means do that job ourselves. We work very closely with our friends like MySERTA, the Department of Public Service, the Department of Health, Department of State, about 19 or 20 different agencies and authorities we have close working relationships with, and those relationships will um, continue to grow, I'm sure, over the next several years. Um, I won't go through all of this because um, Sean Yu did a, an excellent job of um, going through some of the climate science and some of the, the ramifications of some of the projections. I'll just make the last point, um, another way of stating some of the, the factoids that Sean Yu mentioned is that um, some of the same reports that he mentioned indicated that if we, and by that I mean global society, continue emitting greenhouse gases at our current rate, we will lock in um, uh, one and a half degree centigrade warming by 2030. There's a, you can think about a certain budget for greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, that you, and once you reach a certain uh, amount, a certain concentration of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you lock in a certain amount of warming. And again, at our current rate of emissions, we'll lock that in um, by 2030. Um, at, in response to this um, global uh, climate crisis, um, the legislature passed and the governor signed um, on July 18th um, the uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. This act sets the most aggressive <laughs> greenhouse gas reduction goals of any state in the nation. It sets a goal to reduce the economy-wide, 
So this is not New York State operations, um, but economy-wide greenhouse gas emission reductions of 40% of their 1990 levels by 2030 and 85% of their 1990 levels by 2050. It further puts us on a path to carbon neutrality. And what that means is that there is a goal in that legislation that we should um, sequester enough carbon, and I'll talk about that in a little more, uh, to offset that remaining 15% of, of emissions. So when the assumption that there are some activities that we simply can't make carbon emission free, greenhouse gas emissions free, we will have to undertake some activities to offset those emissions up to 15% of those emissions uh, of the 1990 emissions by sequestering those, uh, uh, those greenhouse gases. The law, um, one of the main tools will be implemented by the Public Service Commission, presumably through a modified clean energy standard. Um, it, the law essentially strengthens and codifies some existing clean energy targets. These are very aggressive. I've been told that um, essentially um, this would require a quintupling of the rate at which we are installing utility scale renewables. Um, so we need to be concerned about half, how fast we can site these large utility scale solar and wind facilities. The other thing I'll point out is that um, I don't know if anyone really knows what a, a Terra BTU is, but we have to get rid of 185 um, of them by 2025. Uh, what that boils down to is that we have this um, boils down to a 23% increase in energy efficiency by 2025. And all these goals that relate to building large capacity uh, generation, uh, renewable generation, assume that we make those energy efficiency improvements. Um, so that will be a very important part of the plan over the next um, uh, few decades. The law also has very strong commitments to environmental justice and a just transition. And I'm going the wrong way, I'm transitioning the wrong way. What do I mean by a just transition? The law recognizes that it will be communities, certain industries, certain workers that are put at a disadvantage. And the intent is to um, ameliorate that, in that impact, if you will. <laughs> Besides the work that the Public Service Commission has to do to put in place the, 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 um, the, the, um, the, the mechanisms to achieve those renewable energy and energy efficiency targets, there is established a Climate Action Council. And the, jo the, the job of the Climate Action Council is to develop a scoping plan. You could interpret scoping plan as, an ad as a climate uh, mitigation or climate action plan. This is the, the plan by which uh, that, that will make recommendations on how we will actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. The council has two years to um, come up with a draft and another year to finalize that. The council itself is co-chaired by the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation and the President of NYSERDA. There are 10 other agencies who are statutory members. They're agency heads, they're commissioners, secretary, what have you. They're also members. And then there are 10 other appointments, two non-agency appointments by the governor, and the legislature um, gets to make eight appointments. There are six advisory panels that the council is obligated to form. These are um, uh, uh, correspond to certain, uh, certain emissions sectors, and these are to um, be um, chair, uh, staffed, if you will, um, by experts in these various fields, and their job is to make recommendations uh, to the advisory panel, uh, I'm sorry, to the Climate Action Council as to how to reduce emissions from those sectors. As I mentioned, there is a strong uh, component that uh, looks for environmental justice and climate justice and just transition. Uh, in particular, the, um, there will be a, a climate justice work group formed within DEC, and that group is tasked with identifying criteria by which to identify disadvantaged communities. And this list of disadvantaged communities will be subject to public review, at least six formal public hearings. But the idea is to ensure that a certain percentage of the benefits that accrue from policies put in place as a result of this law go to those disadvantaged communities. Now, where are we now? 
Um, as Connor mentioned, uh, we are our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in New York State um, is our transportation sector. According to the 2016 inventory, um, that was about 36% of our emissions, and that sector is that's growing. That proportion of our emissions that come from transportation is growing. About 30% of our emissions are associated with heating space, cooling space, uh, and heating water, cooking, that kind of thing. Uh, about, people tend to focus on power plants, but only about 15% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the generation of power right now. The reason there are such large targets for installing uh, renewable energy capacity is not to clean up our the, the, the sources of our current energy use, we already have the cleanest electrical grid in the nation, but because the activities that, are, we take, that are, take place in the housing and the transportation sector are going to be electrified. Essentially, the, the overall strategy is to electrify our entire economy. So we're, there's going to be demand for electricity. So as we electrify our cars, electrify our heating, and so forth, we will need that new renewable uh, energy generation capacity. We also have um, emissions in our waste sector. The other one we're worried about is indicated by that blue refrigerator there, refrigerants. Hydrofluorocarbons have very high global warming potential. These are things that are in our air conditioners, building chillers, and so forth. It's illegal to actually emit those, but things leak, and we know that there is a lot of illegal emissions of these. If we continue to emit H hydrofluorocarbons at the, at the rate we are emitting them now, we probably will not be able to achieve our overall greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Uh, because of the high global warming potential. So Governor Cuomo last year ordered the EC to develop a regulation to begin regulating um, emissions of hydrofluorocarbons. That's as in response to the Trump administration's withdrawal of um, laws at the federal level to do that. Uh, and my office expects to issue a, a proposed regulation um, in, this, in the next several months. What will it take to reach 40% reduction by 2030 and ultimate carbon neutrality? We don't know yet uh, because we haven't, the plan hasn't been written yet. And not all the analysis has, has been done. But we know enough to make some general comments. And I'll, if you want to look at that histogram, first of all, um, the, the bar on the left, your left, you know, are the 1990 emissions at about 200 and... Um, 40 emissions, a million metric tons, I believe. Um, and then it peaked in 2005, and we have been declining in total emissions um, since then. However, the thing to recognize is that the law also changes the rules by which we have to calculate our greenhouse gas emissions. Up to now, NYSERDA has produced an annual inventory using the standard uh, federal procedure. Um, the, that does not, did not account for the emissions associated with bringing fuels into the state. The law transfers responsibility for releasing the deer state greenhouse gas inventory to the Department of Environmental Conservation. We will still rely on NYSERDA's expertise, but we are also now required by the law to account for the emissions, the upstream emissions of bringing fuels into New York State. So now we're going to go back and recalculate what was estimated for 1990, and a number of these, these numbers will change somewhat. The thing to be aware of is that last, the, the rightmost histobar is at, I think, currently 36 million metric tons. That's that 15% that we're going to have to offset through some type of sequestration. So what do you do at the local level? Most of us do not have the opportunity to participate at the international level, the national level, or even at the state level, although I do will encourage you to participate in the stakeholder opportunities that are available as we develop the scoping, uh, scoping plan. But we all have the opportunity to participate at the local level. New York State, in 2009, launched an interagency program known as the Climate Smart Communities Program. This is has grown to be the most comprehensive state program in the nation to provide support for local climate action. We provide free technical assistance currently through NYSERDA's Clean Energy Community Coordinators. 
There are uh, guidance and tools uh, available on our website. There is funding available, including for uh, rebates for municipally owned or leased zero emissions vehicles and installation of charging infrastructure, um, and grants that we uh, uh, provide for mitigation projects and adaptation projects. There are currently 283 registered climate smart communities in the state. Um, 35 of them here in Westchester. Westchester was very much uh, the home of early adopters. Not all of you had, not all the early adopters that took the pledge readily in 2009, 2010, have really followed through as much as we would like, and we'll talk about that in a moment. In 2014, having recognized that we needed a leadership recognition program, and we needed to provide a framework that could guide local planning. We announced uh, uh, the, um, the Climate Smart Community Certification Program. So every community that takes the pledge is known as a registered Climate Smart Community. <clears throat> but if you, as a community, documents completed actions and reaches a certain threshold, then we can say you are a certified Climate Smart Community. And there are 34 of those. The town of Cortland was part of the pilot in 2014. It was one of the original six climate smart communities, certified climate smart communities. Unfortunately, your certification only lasts for five years. And we had to essentially rescind the town of Cortland's certification this past year because the town did not reapply. I would encourage you that uh, for whatever reason, talk to your town, get reorganized into a climate smart community task force. Um, have the town fathers, um, leaders, better term, town leaders appoint a coordinator and get back on the bandwagon. Now is the time to commit or recommit, make a plan, develop a climate action plan, follow it. We can provide, as I said, technical and funding uh, assistance and prepare for the long haul. Achieving these emission reduction goals is not a matter of a few affluent people driving bolts or Priuses or changing some light bulbs. Uh, we are going to, every one of us is going to be involved in this fight for the rest of our lives. Our children will have to do this. And so we need to set up a plan that provides for sustained action at the local level as well as the state, national, and international levels. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, the status of the appointees to the boards and committees that are part of our New York State law. Um, have they been appointed yet? Do we know? The legislative minority leaders, the leader in each of the two chambers, have appointed, made their appointments. Neither the governor nor the majority have announced their appointees, and I have absolutely no insight as to who they might be. The, um, the Senate majority, the Senate minority leader's appointment was Gavin Donahue, and I remember him because I just used to work for him. Um, and I, there's another minority member appointed a um, representative from the um, gas supply industry. Okay, so we're partly there. Partly. We can't yet have a meeting until. Well, the, the law does not take effect until January 1st, and that's okay. an important point I forgot to mention. Okay, that's, that's good to know. All right, and our very last speaker, Donovan um, Gordon, who's going to talk about NYSERDA. Let me, before you start, with the slides that we have, if anybody wants a copy of them, could you send them to us, and then we'll send them out. You just call my office, and we'll send them to you. Does that work? Okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Gallup, and, um, and fellow panelists. I'm not going to break the trend here. That side stood up. This side's going to sit down. Using <laughs> 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 you know, baseball metaphor. <laughs> you know, I'm batting cleanup, so I'm going to take it home, and I'm literally going to make it useful to you about about your homes. So I'm the director of clean heating and cooling for NYSERDA. And as was just mentioned, uh, buildings account for 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions in New York State. So it's an awesome challenge to be charged with addressing that problem and, that, and uh, finding solutions 
for a big uh, carbon uh, producer in New York State. So, uh, and actually, as you get further south, like to New York City, uh, approximately almost seventy percent of the carbon emissions come from buildings, and they're all big buildings. But I'm going to do an impromptu survey. And I did not bring slides, so I'm just going to talk to you, and and, uh, and hopefully it will uh, resonate with you. How many? Folks here heat their homes with fuel oil. How many with propane? Oil? How many with natural gas? Okay. So I've I've coined this phrase. Uh, we know uh, we've heard the phrase uh, calendar year, fiscal year, dog years. I've coined HVAC years, and the reason I say that is that the typical lifespan of the HVAC system, um, your boiler or your air conditioner is 15 to 20 years. So let's go on the top of it, 20 years. So if you, let's, we're now in 2020, essentially. If you uh, install a brand new boiler or furnace in January 2020, those 20, 30 goals that we just talked about, irrelevant, we've blown right through it, okay? Uh, we hope to convert to in 24. Um, and if we don't, you're not helping us in 25. You've just not helped us at all. So essentially, I've got one shot to convert you. So when people say 2030 or 2050, it sounds so far away. But in HVAC years, it's one. If you, if you put, install a new one today. So I really want to say there's a real sense of urgency. So if your current heating system is 15 to 20 years old right now, I would encourage you to go to the back and look at and talk to Sustainable Westchester or talk to Con Ed about their heat pump programs and install a heat pump, not a new boiler furnace, uh, fossil fuel based. We also talked about the goals um, of the 40% reduction and 85% reduction by 2050. We talked about the uh, internally called CLCPA now, um, we might share a lot of acronyms, um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. It, it does codify our goals. It is the first uh, climate law of any state in the country. So, uh, so Governor Cuomo is progressive, and I applaud that. I know you were behind this, so thank you, and thank you for voting yes um, on this. And we want to build it. I'll probably have a off the back channel, off line conversation with you about some of my uh, thoughts on that. But what really is important about this is that it is the uh, community protection side of it, where it really is focusing on helping low to moderate uh, income residents in New York State to make sure that they have access to these technologies. But more importantly, I keep telling folks the clean energy agenda in New York State is also a really a clean energy economy agenda. This is about transforming our economy from a fossil fuel based economy to a clean energy economy and creating new and sustainable long-lasting jobs. So really important. So I will get into how, uh, so I'll go back there. All these goals and all that we've talked about means nothing if you folks don't convert. If you don't install heat pumps and you don't get electric vehicles. It really is the community, the residents now converting and, tra and transitioning to this clean, clean energy um, solution. Again, I'll focus on buildings. So how do you reduce CO2 in your buildings? And I'll also get into CO, because we don't talk about that, but that's even more important. So um, first, I will recommend that you get an energy audit um, to find out the energy use of your home. Um, I serve it uh, through our Green Jobs Green New York uh, program, has free, offers free energy audits. So uh, I encourage you to get it on our website, or I'll be able to do information to Sustainable Westchester so you can get that done, so you at least get that, uh, that uh, first level assessment. Uh, secondly, we call it energy efficiency, uh, doing energy efficiency work. It's not that hard, it's simple. Um, air sealing um, and uh, insulation. If you reduce your thermal load uh, by just putting a little more insulation or sealing, corking your windows and putting in uh, high efficiency windows, uh, that takes you almost 70% of the hit. That's a huge, huge help. Uh, and it will reduce your cost of installing some of these heat pumps because you won't need as big a size heat pump because your thermal load is, is, is reduced through these really simple uh, activities of uh, 
of uh, insulation and air sealing. Uh, we call it uh, putting on your socks and your cap. If you do uh, seal the basement and the roof, um, you're about 70% there. So start there first. <clears throat> now, getting into heat pumps, <clears throat> I'll describe heat pumps. So your current systems, the combustible systems, uh, you actually burn something on site. You burn the fuel. Um, whether it's oil, propane, or natural gas, you're burning something. And with that, it creates uh, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Um, a heat pump actually transfers heat from one place to another. And it uses electricity. So when that electricity is produced cleanly through the solar or wind, <coughs> um, it's now clean. You just, you're, you're at net zero, right? Shandu. Hopefully you have an electric vehicle, too. But plug in. Plug it. Okay, pl close enough. But he, where he is, is where we all need to get to. Um, and, and where we'll all be 10 to 15 years from now, if we uh, really, not if, when we apply and implement the law uh, the way it's intended to be. As you know, there's a spirit in the letter, and we, we, the spirit is converting to all of these technologies. So let me start with air source heat pumps. So. Uh, there's several types, um, uh, mini splits, I'm sure you've probably seen those around, these those things that sort of mounted on the wall, they can have those, those, those are mini splits, they're very cost effective and uh, can do a, a job uh, for it in, in a small space so you can put multiple uh, units throughout, throughout the home. Uh, they also have what we call ducted air source heat pump systems, <coughs> which uh, are like, if you have a central air conditioner, it will be similar uh, 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 Construction, but it's just the condenser outside has a reverse valve, so it provides heating and cooling. And by the way, your air conditioner is a heat pump. Your refrigerator is a heat pump. We all have heat pumps in our homes at this point right now. A ground source heat pump actually uses the constant temperature of the ground of the earth. And once you uh, end up in the northeast, once you go five to ten feet below the surface, uh, it maintains a constant temperature of about 55 degrees. And what we're doing, we insert pipes, uh, and I, I saw this, uh, uh, this flyer um, over in the Sustainable Westchester, so I encourage every single one to stop by the Sustainable <laughs> Westchester booth and get this flyer. Uh, they have a, a diagram of the geothermal pipes going into the ground. You circulate uh, fluid, water, and you know, put an antifreeze, uh, propylene glycol, which is food, the food grade um, uh, antifreeze. And it basically, takes the temperature of the earth and brings it into the home uh, into a heat pump and refrigerants, you can take it up to about as high as 120 degrees. So those are the two primary uh, heat pump technologies for residential homes. Uh, from a cost standpoint, the geothermal is uh, or ground source heat pumps are the most expensive because you, you're uh, bringing in a driller to drill uh, boreholes and certain pipes. But in terms of longevity, uh, the geothermal is the longest. So in terms of the life cycle cost, the geothermal is probably the cheapest because it will last longer, <clears throat> but the air source heat pumps is like uh, a regular appliance, you know, your uh, boiler furnace, the last 15 to 20 years and you, you put it in the moon. So um, whatever it is, a heat pump is certainly optimal and, and certainly highly recommended. This conversation has been about uh, climate change. Uh, which is certainly an appropriate conversation to have in, 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 in making sure we don't uh, increase the temperature by 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius or by 2050. And heat pumps certainly will reduce that because there is no uh, carbon emissions on site, no CO2 emitted because you're not burning anything, you're just transferring, taking heat and transferring from one place to, to the other. But this is the, in my view, the most important aspect of a heat pump that's very, very rarely talked about. <clears throat> because uh, particularly in these low to moderate income uh, uh, communities, uh, there's a high uh, cases of asthma and upper respiratory um, uh, ailments. And that's due to the in inhaling of carbon monoxide. Um, and when you install a heat pump, there's no carbon monoxide emitted. So it is the healthiest. So if you want, if you want a healthy indoor environment, we're talking about the external outdoor air quality. The indoor air quality is even more important because I, I've stated this internally that you know 
yes, you know, I, I want to work on uh, mitigating the problem 30 years from now, but if we keep inhaling these carbon monoxide, we may not be well enough or alive to enjoy it 30 years from now. So we really need to start installing these equipment now from a health standpoint. And that actually is resonating quite well. Um, particularly if you're, you're young, you have a mom with kids, and you, know, you want to make food, uh, uh, raise your kids in a healthy environment. Uh, so those are the two technologies. So in terms of heat pump incentives, I'm really happy to see Sustainable West Tester. I'm also happy to see Con Ed. Um, so NYSERDA, Con Ed, we have incentives for ground source heat pumps and air source, but we have for air source, for ground source heat pumps. Con Ed, I believe, has for, um, for air source heat pumps. And uh, come next year, I think the second quarter, the Con Edison will be running um, all of the heat pump uh, incentive programs uh, in their service territory. So um, happy to see them here. Uh, Sustainable Westchester is our partner at the local level uh, where they're doing community outreach and education. They're partnered with, with several contractors, one that's on their flyer at the end of the line, uh, who has a, 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 an arrangement with Con Edison to install the um, uh, line in Con Edison territory. You actually get an extra $5,000 off. So I encourage you to, before you leave, to stop by Sustainable Westchester and talk to Con Edison about their programs to install. Different groups that have um, their pamphlets and information, just be sure to stop um, and um, pick that up. Um, so, Donovan, I think you answered this. I'm getting all these questions. Okay. Is I'm getting these questions, and I think maybe this you just answered. Is the 1.5 um, um, goal achievable simply with technolo technological fixes without changing the suburban sand? Single family home residential pattern. We're kind of in that area where single family homes. Well, yes. I think you so, answered it. Yes, yeah, so okay. you actually answered it. We have the technology today. Um, and yeah, several years ago, it was not cost effective. Uh, costs are coming down. Incentive uh, programs are being uh, launched to, to help uh, buy those costs down. Um, and we now have a law that's saying we need to transform to this. So um, I did a presentation several months ago saying we now have. Everything's in alignment. We have legislation, um, uh, uh, we have policy, we have regulation, and we have programs through the legislature, through DEC, through Public Service Commission, Department of Public Service, and NYSERDA, all in alignment, you know, trying to achieve these goals. Okay, we have a question here. Whoever wants to answer it, are there programs to encourage and aid school districts to reduce emission and operate more sustainably? Sustainable. Yes. Yeah, I guess you pointed me. So, we had, uh, <laughs> so yes, um, and actually, um, uh, NYPA, New York Power Authority, is the one that um, provides electricity and services um, a lot of the schools. And we actually did a program with them called the Geothermal Clean Energy um, uh, Challenge. Uh, and we're encouraging schools. Uh, we also have a P through 12 uh, uh, program that we're going to educate. Uh, the school districts and um, offer subsidies uh, for programs for them to uh, install these technologies. And I also want to add in to that educational aspects where we actually do an educational program tied to this. So they're seeing this, these technologies installed and we're also educating the kids on the technology so they can become uh, workers uh, in a few years. Okay, question for Shandu. Um, what uh, impact does population growth have? If people had their children five years later, or reduced the number by one, um, et cetera, would that amplify the impact of cutting the, uh, of the economy cutting carbon emissions? Yeah, that's a population. Can you hear me? No. No, turn, turn it on. Um, and then I think you're good. It's on. Yeah. yeah. So to first order, I think combating climate change is not about making sacrifices or changing our way of life. It's about choices that we make. So, you know, your furnace, your car, uh, your use of public transport, your diet. Uh, one of the things I tell people who ask me, what can I do, is to say, take a step in any one of these dimensions. So if you're driving a big SUV, ask yourself if your next car could be a family sedan, or maybe it could be a hybrid, or maybe a plug-in hybrid, 
or maybe all the way to an ED. And similarly, nobody's saying you should just become vegan tomorrow. And you do a meatless Monday once a week. Your body will thank you for it, and it has a lower carbon impact. So I don't think it's about changing fundamentally the, the life that we live. It's about the choices that we make. And we all have it in our power to make better choices. Um, Westchester County is known for its beautiful scenery of green forests. What is being done to eliminate the vine that is completely overtaking our trees and as a result killing 100 year old trees? This may be to the Department of Transportation, I'm not sure, uh, along our major roads, but we want to comment about how we're going to save our trees um, in this environment. Yeah. <laughs> It's a real problem because we are having more invasive vines and plants and when you look along our roads, Route 9, 9A, um, you know, we, we see what's going on. And I just know from the Department of Transportation it's a very expensive project, not an easy one. I don't know if there's anybody here from T-Town, but T-Town uh, worked on that a lot uh, within their community. So I don't know whether anybody has a comment. We can Okay. I would only just comment that we do, without knowing any of the specifics about the vine that's taking over Westchester or what's being done about it, we certainly anticipate that um, climate change, one of the worst effects that we were likely to see, one of the most damaging effects to both our agricultural systems and our natural ecosystems are um, invasive species and pests that are likely to become more prevalent, perhaps leading us to use more pesticides and having still more than uh, you know, health effects and environmental effects from the increased use of pesticides. So certainly it's something that we have to be aware of when we think about how we are adapting to climate change and how we're going to address those invasive uh, and pest species. Okay, David Carlucci, our state senator, has just arrived. Maybe he knows about trees and vines. <laughs> okay, the next question I have been recycling. The person said, I've been recycling for decades as a resident of Westchester County. It seems that we are losing ground in this area. Can you please discuss the current challenges around recycling and the prospects for overcoming those challenges? Perhaps it's an outdated solution. I would don't. I'll let Connor know, but I'll just respond that um, I don't think recycling is outdated. We have to do it better. Um, I think that there are the the current crisis is coming about because China, to a large extent, decided to take our garbage, um, and we also don't recycle very well. We put things in our recycling bins that hurt people, um, that jam up uh, separating machines that make the stream unusable and that uh, because we don't rinse things out. Uh, and so if we can recycle better, we have a better chance of being able to develop local markets and local uses for those materials. Um, it, it's going to be a very difficult problem, but given the in, amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are embedded in everything we use, uh, we can't afford to be wasteful and to give up on recycling. That is it. And yes, go ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I, um, I, I certainly agree with what Mark had to say there. Uh, we also think that the emphasis needs to be shifted more towards eliminating single-use um, objects like plastics uh, and what have you, and, and focus more on reusable containers. Um, right. This is not a good thing we did today. <laughs> uh, and there's also, uh, in our view, it needs to be a push towards uh, producer responsibility. Um, uh, manufacturers that are out there, companies that are out there making these single-use products, uh, they need to have some responsibility on ultimately what the end life of those products would be. Yeah, I can just very quickly add anything we put in our recycling bins, whether it's plastic or paper or whatever, which produces more emissions. Therefore, we have to live without producing trash. Think about that for a minute, right? Live without producing trash. That means if there's organic waste, you compost it. Sending it to a landfill means it will sit there for 20 years and generate methane. That's just the worst thing you can do with organic trash. So you compost your organic waste and you avoid any other trash. Just do not buy something if it comes with packaging. 
and then you won't have trash, and then you don't need diesel belching trucks to come to your house to pick up trash. You've got to change the way we think about this stuff. You can't just produce trash and leave it to someone else's problem to deal with it. Just do not produce trash, do not use plastic, compost your organic waste, and when you buy stuff, if it comes with packaging, don't buy it. Take your bag to the grocery store, buy produce, put it in the bag. You don't need layers of plastic on everything. Of solid waste plant just um, had a part of it for um, food waste, uh, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure. There's nobody here from the county, but um, I think it did. Okay, next question. New York is taking a leading role in emissions. What are you seeing from other states? Are most states moving forward with some action plans? Do we know where other people are? Uh, Yes, uh, well, California certainly is uh, very progressive in, in the Northeast. Uh, Massachusetts is also doing a lot. Uh, Connecticut is, uh, I, I try to have uh, uh, meetings or conference calls with several other states, uh, Northeast states, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, Vermont. They're, they're all trying Maine. It's got some aggressive goals as well, too. So it's, it's, it's catching up. A lot of states are really progressive. Yeah, let me just add very quickly to that. Internationally speaking, uh, 60 countries have declared a goal of getting to net zero economy-wide. The most aggressive of those 60 countries is Norway by 2032. And this includes all their maritime infrastructure, which is going to be a real challenge. Uh, the last bit of getting fully neutral is by offsetting. That's usually how it works to get the last mile there. Uh, within the United States, there are eight states and Washington, D.C. that have uh, either legislation or a gubernatorial executive order to get to net zero. Uh, the most aggressive is California, uh, economy-wide 2045. Uh, Hawaii is pretty aggressive, and the other states that were mentioned here. So uh, there's, there's a lot of activity around the world and across the country. Uh, it would be great if all levels of government were aligned, but hopefully we'll get there soon. Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is the gold standard. I talked about the delegation a couple of weeks ago, Denmark. Uh, Denmark, right now, um, you cannot install any heating system that's fossil fuel based. Um, new construction or retrofit. It's got to be a pump. Um, so, uh, you know. There's a time when you didn't have to wear seatbelts, and they said, we think you should, and they said, you have to. Um, you're going to have to get into that. I have a feeling that Senator Kowichi and I have a job to do with some bills. <laughs> Neither one of us are environmental chair, but we can get involved in that. Okay, a suggestion just for Sandy, if, if you're watching these TVs, they're too small to read from six rows back. I apologize. And, uh, but again, if you want to have the slides, please just call our office. And we will uh, email them out to you, or we'll print them out and send them out to you. Okay, question. I worked. Um, I work at a 150-bed uh, hospital that does not have any um, uh, charging stations on the premises. Um, is there any proposed state legislation to mandate? Here we are with mandating that large employees uh, have EV charging stations. So, do you think we'll get to that point? Do you think environmental advocates? Well, I think, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot of that come out of the climate action plan that Mark was talking about, uh, and that's going to really develop sort of that map of the different actions that are going to need to be taken. And, you know, that could very well be a recommendation uh, made by the Climate Action Council. Uh, and, you know, it could very well be that we're going to look down the road at, at sort of these building code type examples where we, we have these sort of EV building, building codes and mandates that larger institutions um, you know, be able to accommodate uh, these types of um, infrastructure and, uh, and electric vehicles. Right now, there's some money available in Westchester if someone like that hospital wants to put in charging stations, and it covers most of the cost of putting them in. And if they have any sense, they allow free charging to their employees. Call them environmental heroes and give them their own parking space. Is this, a, is this an opportunity for employees to speak out um, 
uh, to their employers. I don't know whether this is a suggestion box that some employers have, uh, or whether you have the ability to just go forward and make your recommendations, but if you say that you're there with an electric vehicle, we need to be able to, you know, use something there, will, will they get on with it, do you think? Okay. All right, I believe it's, uh, Don, maybe this is for you. Uh, I believe it's very important to add climate and solutions to the curriculum in the schools as soon as possible. How important is for you? And I think you mentioned yes. that in your so, presentation. So what um, we're doing, we have a um, really aggressive workforce development. So as the um, Department of Public Service is looking to issue an order to the utilities to um, offer incentives for heat pumps, and I sort of will focus on what we call market enablement, the number one and most important activity that I'll be focused on is workforce development. And not necessarily, uh, yes, up upskilling uh, current workers, but starting from middle school on out, uh, particularly high school kids, because if we can get a, a high school graduate to get into this, uh, into this clean energy space out of high school, they will be riding this to 2050. They will help us get to 2050. If I could just add to that, uh, Mark had brought up the concept of just transition earlier, and this is a very good example of that just transition. Uh, part of what the Climate Community Protection Act sought to do uh, is make sure that uh, we're invested in, in those communities that have been harmed the most by uh, pollution over the years. And this is a great example of what a just transition means for those communities. It's not just bringing clean technology to, communities, to those communities, it's bringing the resources that they need so that they can then take advantage of that uh, transfer to the new clean energy economy and bring those jobs to those communities. In fact, I have one thing. Um, school boards and folks at the community colleges, we really need to talk to them to start adding these to the curriculum. Um, I'd love to talk to West Dutch Community College to offer a course in how to install and design heat pumps and certainly the engineering school because um, one of the biggest issues for coming from engineering firms and contractors is just having their school. We can work with you on that. Okay. Uh, why aren't there more large scale solar farms? Is is there, maybe that's with the DEC, are people, why don't, why don't we have more? I know there was one proposed in Putnam Valley at one point and it went by the wayside. Um, I, I think that one of the major concerns we are facing is the, this local opposition. Uh, I'm not so sure if that takes place here, but certainly in uh, western New York, we have a lot of towns that have adopted um, uh, zoning that ban, or moratoria that ban utility scale solar and wind. Um, and that is going to make it impossible to meet these goals. And one of the things that I think people have to think about, especially the, I'm assuming that most people are here because they care about what happens to the climate. And you know, we, run, we see these situations where local boards are confronted with those who are opposed to these types of facilities. And they don't hear uh, many people talking about why they think that we need these kinds of facilities and their willingness to accept these these types of facilities in their um, municipality. So I think that dynamic has to change. We do need to hear, the, the local decision makers need to hear the voices of those who recognize that installing these large facilities is a necessity. I'll just add that permitting issues are always a huge headache and Never mind a utility scale of wind farm or solar farm. Um, we have two sets of solar panels in our house, one on the roof for the heat pumps and the lights, the one in the yard for the car. And coming to this building is a little bit of a nightmare for me because getting permits for that was just horrendous. <laughs> and I, I think back to just to the large uh, just to the large scale question. You also have an issue of if you're getting large enough. Uh, you can either go through that local process or uh, you'll go through uh, the state siting process, known as the Article 10 uh, siting process. And there have been a lot of issues in terms of implementation of that process as well. And uh, you know that's the pulling up of uh, uh, these projects actually getting in the ground. 
Um, so it's, it's an issue that I think the state's really going to have to take a hard look at in the coming year as to how they can more improve that process and, uh, and whether or not they need additional resources dedicated to it. Okay, we, um, you know, we have Indian Point up here, and uh, just so you know, so there was a question, um, which is closed, the nuclear plant, um, and, and there were some questions here about, you know, why are we doing that, if, if that's better for our environment, or what is the plan to increase the added electricity that will be needed, and then there's another question here about New York State doesn't use frack gas or allowing fracking, but it does allow other states to transport frack gas across New York State, and that we stop. You know, does anybody want to comment on any of those Well, I'll take this. Uh, I'm not going to answer whether it can be stopped. The, the, essentially, the law says that by 2050, we won't be using any gas, and remember what I said about the law changing the rules that we have to follow when we do our emissions inventory, and we are now required to account for the emissions associated, not with just combusting that gas in New York State, but with the emissions associated with extracting it, and anything like leaks, uh, and pipeline leaks or compressor station leaks on the way of getting it here. So um, there will be more incentive to reduce those, those emissions, um, because it will now be much more visible um, the extent to which that those uh, gas associated, emissions associated with gas are part of our inventory. We are almost surely vastly underestimating the effect of burning natural gas here in New York State currently. It's, it's a little bit out of my area, but I'm you know, fairly um, familiar. So that's why we're trying to really build an offshore wind uh, to, to accommodate for that, some more of the community uh, large-scale solar. And, and storage. <clears throat> so that's how we're trying to, to generate the electricity. And um, as you, you're well aware, um, the, we're already starting the movement on um, natural gas because you've seen some of these denials of, of uh, pipelines and things in moratorium. So um, I'm not going to get into that, but you're already starting to see the uh, response from the government. I'll oh, get into that. Right, and, and getting, getting into that a little bit, um, we've been at Con Ed meetings um, last January, February, we learned from Con Ed um, that not in this area, but a little bit further south and the rest of the county, that there, wouldn't, there would be a limitation of moratorium on gas hookups uh, for development. Um, and then, you know, so a lot of people were upset and a lot of people said, well, this is gonna lead us into heat pumps and other kinds of activities. So, so what's the bottom line with Con Ed not having enough gas coming in for new development and so on? Or are we on the right track? Uh, then we get alternative. Well, I'm here for the alternative. Okay. Uh, so what <laughs> that, 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 that was, in Westchester, we've implemented what we call the Clean, Clean Energy Action One. Um, so we have put additional resources in, in Westchester, into Westchester County to encourage and um, help developers, because uh, that's who um, uh, were the biggest complaints, uh, to adopt and install uh, heat pump solutions. That's what I was just going to add. When you look at our energy sources, if we rely on nuclear, you are producing toxic waste that you don't know what to do with in your lifetime or the next 50 generations. Why in the world would any right-thinking person do that? Okay. You're just passing on a stupid problem that nobody knows how to solve to future generations. So it's closing in Indian Point, it's closed in Vermont Yankee, it's closed across Germany, it's closing everywhere, it's, it's what it is. Secondly, you talk about gas, okay? So we don't permit fracking in our state, but we allow it to come in from other states. Frankly, that's hypocritical. Yes. Yes. So, you to me, with, with natural gas, there's nothing natural about natural gas, so let's call it methane or frac gas. With frac gas, uh, it takes very little leakage in that system to negate the benefits of clean burning gas. And uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, did a study on this and said, you might as well burn coal because our gas pipelines were mostly built in the 60s or earlier. They have leaks, and the leakage is enough that when you combine it with a higher heat trapping index of methane, you're not really getting any benefits. Now, 
we have a wonderful geological gift on the East Coast. The entire eastern seaboard has a shallow continental shelf just beyond the viewshed where you can pin offshore turbines as much as 8, 10, 12 megawatts a piece. And the wind is so steady offshore, it's a boon. It's a wonderful source of energy. The sun is shining. What, we, let's make use of things that we know how to clean up and not leave problems for generations to come. And gas is a bridge to nowhere. Let's get past it as quickly as we can. Yeah. We're just going to do like three quick questions, and, and then we're going to let some of the groups come up. Maybe they want to come up here so they can explain some of the things that they're working on. Um, so we have a question about wind and solar sources for electricity are not constant or controllable. Um, how will supply and demand be balanced with, with 80 to 100 percent of electricity is from renewables? So the question is, you know, are, are, are they secure and safe and will they provide? Okay. Um, and then there's another question. Currently, when I looked at heat, for heat pumps uh, for natural gas and water radiators, none were available. What do I do and within a reasonable budget? And then the last one, are there environmental implications in the production and disposal of solar panels? Um, you know, as we go forward, do we have other problems? So I don't know who wants to talk about what or not at all. I'll address the, the okay. heat pump solution. Okay. So I will, whoever um, raised that question, please go to Sustainable Westchester's desk because they will tell you all uh, the, the solutions that they're promoting uh, in Westchester for heat pumps. Uh, and also kind of because they have this arrangement with uh, with Dandelion. So um, heat pumps are here, it's, they work, and they're cost effective, whether it's air source or ground source. So they, they will be able to answer if you can, they can, come to me or go to my service website. Okay. In terms of the intermittency, you'll notice that those goals that I put up there include three, three, three gigawatts of um, battery storage. That is intended to help balance load uh, and account for that intermittency. That's a lot of storage. It can be battery, it could be pump storage, um, but that's, that's the intent. Is to, and we also need tra better transmission uh, lines to move power around so we can get it from, um, from the, the, the world and, and move it further south. But also better transmission will help us balance um, demand with, um, with sources. Mark, and, and batteries are not the only way of dealing with intermittency. That's a big part of it. And thanks to electronics and then electric vehicles, battery technology is just getting better and cheaper all the time. Um, but in addition to that, uh, a smarter grid will help us balance our needs with what nature is providing to us. In other words, when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, we'll charge your car at night and then we'll pause it if necessary, until the wind picks up again. And you won't know the difference in the morning. Or we'll turn thermostats down by half a degree across a million homes to postpone or prepone a load. So there's many ways of doing this, and digital solutions are part of it, a smarter grid is part of it, uh, and battery storage, of course, is going to be a big part of it. So again, this is a problem that is, is um, we know how to deal with it, and there are other parts of the world that get 100% of their energy during certain parts of the year from renewables, and they are able to manage their grid, so we can too. And one last thing, in an emergency, your electric vehicle is a battery and can be used in a pinch if you really need to get some energy for a couple of things. I actually stay at the Holiday Inn Express up in Albany, and they have uh, a place if I had an electric vehicle for me to plug in. They have a couple places, um, which is very good. Um, could I? Be, be there was a question about the totally environmental impact of solar panels. Include, um, the solar panels, yes. Yeah. Is there a negative on the solar panels? Do you know what we're getting into? I, mean, I think with with any product that's, that's being produced, you know, there's going to be ways that you have to deal with the end of life, and it's certainly something that is is worth taking a look at uh, and making sure that we do have sort of that producer responsibility in place that they have sort of end of life plans for for what to do with these um, panels as they age out and get replaced. 
Um, I'm sorry we didn't get through all, but they were wonderful questions. We just didn't get through all of them, but some of them are, are repetitive of what we had. Um, I'd like to ask um, the Hudson Highlands Land Trust, are they here? Um, or Cena Hudson is here. Just the groups, please come up and tell us about what you've got in the back, in the, on the back table or what, you know, just quickly what you're working on in the community and what people in the community can do. Uh, to participate with you. Con Ed also to come up and sustainable Westchester Federated Conservationist, Westchester Land Trust. Introduce yourself. Uh, good evening everyone. My name is Lori Ensinger and I'm the president Is the microphone on? Um, yeah, just, <coughs> is that better? You hold the other one. Let me hold the other one. Uh, my name is Lori Ensinger and I'm the president of the Westchester Land Trust. Uh, I'm here to be a voice for the land. Uh, Westchester Land Trust is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're headquartered right here in Westchester County in Medford Hills. Our mission territory is all of Westchester County and the eastern half of Putnam County, so a very large service territory. Our mission is to work with public and private landowners to preserve land in perpetuity and to protect the natural resources in Westchester and eastern Putnam. We focus on the most environmentally sensitive lands that are uh, in our midst. Uh, and over our 31 years of uh, existence, we've preserved nearly 9,000 acres. So I think um, one or more of our panelists may challenge me on this statistic. But to give you a sense of how important this is for the topic of tonight, uh, when you think very simplistically about net carbon emissions, we emit CO2 through the burning of fossil fuels, and then we can sequester or sink it uh, through several functions, but predominantly through our natural lands. So what Westchester Land Trust tries to do in this equation is to provide and preserve forever those natural lands that act as carbon sinks. So to give you a sense of context, in this area of the country, New England, uh, New York, about one acre of woman sequesters about 100 tons of carbon, and incrementally about three to five tons per year. Our wetlands can sequester many times that amount, and tidal wetlands are among the most productive in terms of carbon sequestration, as are uh, properly uh, managed agricultural lands. So in our 31 years, as I said, we've preserved nearly 9,000 acres. That would be the equivalent of about a million tons of sequestered carbon in aggregate, uh, and on a year-by-year -year basis, several uh, tens of thousands more. So we're equivalently taking many, many thousands of cars off the road. Um, Sean did mention, that I, and did a great job, by the way, talking about the IPCC report. Sean, I think the 2019 report was specifically addressing land and climate. So the role that land use plays, um, and what we uh, believe is that natural lands can be about one-third of the solution. So emissions and reducing emissions are key and critical and absolutely mandatory. But saving our natural lands is the other part of the equation that we can't forget about. So what you can do is understand how you can preserve lands in your community. Westchester Land Trust is your regional land trust for Westchester. I'll try to answer the tree question if I might. No, just uh, we have to get through everything else to close down. Can you do it in two words? The tree. The trees. There are many tree swarms, so join up with vine cutters uh, across the county, and it's because it's expensive. We rely on people like you to help us. So there are many organizations throughout the county who will do that. Thank you so much. I will not answer the tree question. Um, my name is Audrey Friedrichsen. I am staff attorney with Cedar Hudson. We are also a 501c3. Like uh, Westchester Land Trust, we are a land trust, but also an advocacy organization. I apologize because I'm going to read from a list, which is what I try not to do normally when speaking publicly, but I have a lot of information, a uh, five-point list that I want to give to you tonight. Uh, uh, of what Scenic Hudson has been doing here in the Hudson Valley and the interest of making us a model of how a region responds to climate change and not just a, a model but 
uh, an example of what other regions, other states can do. So number one, uh, really in the vein of what Lori just mentioned, we protect lands that make habitats more resilient to rising sea levels. She mentioned those tidal wetlands. Uh, we also protect acres of lands in the interest of creating those things that are both resilient and also adaptive and also carbon sinks. Um, number two, uh, speaking of fracked gas, we fight new fossil fuel infrastructure. We fought against the Pilgrim Pipeline proposal that was going to bring uh, crude oil up and down the throughway. Uh, we worked against the Hudson River anchorages, and right now we are opposing the new proposed dam scammer. Uh, not natural gas uh, power plant because just like a new boiler will lock you into fossil fuels, that's going to lock us into fossil fuels for the next 30 years and natural gas is a bridge to nowhere. We totally agree. Um, and on the agriculture front, also in the interest of sequestering carbon, we are supporting and encouraging farmers' use of climate-smart agricultural practices. It's basically almost going back to the old ways, no-till, uh, using natural fertilizers. Um, we uh, have done a study. We are working with partners. Um, really in the interest of trying to support regenerative farming here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, and then with regard to sea level rise, which is an issue for a lot of our communities here on the Hudson River, we've created a sea level rise mapper. Uh, we have a protecting the pathways uh, plan, and also we have helped form what's called the Hudson Valley Flood Resilience Network. But our fifth thing that we've been working on is directly related to that question of why aren't we seeing more solar projects on the ground. We have been really working to promote renewable energy and make sure that it's getting developed in terms of our energy source and also to support that transportation uh, transition. Um, but we also, we are at heart a conservation organization. We've all worked really hard to conserve our agricultural, our historic, uh, resources here in the Hudson Valley. So how do we do that and create those win-win situations? So we've published a guide to citing renewable energy. Um, we are working on a GIS-based solar siting decision support tool. If anyone has a better name for that, please see me out or let me know. Uh, and just caught off the press today, we have put out a clean energy roadmap uh, for the future of uh, New York with the Hudson Valley as a model. So I'm going to hand off the microphone, and I'm also going to give copies of that to our panelists. I think I already gave one. And thank you very much. So thank, thank you very much. Okay. Hi everybody, my name is Jeff Rosenzweig, I'm with Con Edison, I'm here with my colleague Adam Smith, uh, we are both in a division of Con Edison that's referred to as the Energy Efficiency and Demand Management Group. It is our group that's responsible for advising clients, specifically as far as uh, I am concerned, commercial and industrial clients, the largest in New York, advising them on how to become more energy efficient and how and the incentives or incentive programs that are available to those companies uh, to take advantage of to inspire them and assist them financially in taking on energy efficiency projects. So I personally am with a group within the energy efficiency and demand management team that advises those clients, we meet with them on a daily basis, and ultimately it is my group that incentivizes or provides money to those buildings, to those customers, uh, to reduce their energy consumption. We do this for two reasons. Uh, one reason is because it's a lot cheaper to <coughs> financially incentivize customers to become more energy efficient than it is to build new pipelines and building wires. We could not literally give away all the money that we had to give away last year, tens of millions of dollars. We had the same uh, on board for 2020. And uh, I'm literally in the enviable position of trying to get our customers to take that money from us. <laughs> and of course, in order to get that money from us, they have to take on these energy efficiency projects, but it's there. For the ticket. 
And the biggest problem we have is an awareness issue in making our programs, uh, putting our programs out there. The second reason that we do this is because we have mandates by the state, uh, by the Public Service Commission, to achieve certain energy reduction goals in our portfolio. So we, as a group, as a company, have mandates. Uh, we have goals to achieve. We as a group, the Energy Efficiency and Demand Management Group, have goals to achieve. And I, as an individual, have goals to achieve. So uh, that is the purpose of our program. So these incentives are paid uh, based on the energy reduction. We pay in dollars per therm reduced. Uh, on an annualized basis, we pay in dollars per kilowatt hour reduced based on these projects. And these projects could be Literally, if you think about a building and you think about everything that the building utilizes that consumes electricity or natural gas, if there's any retrofits done to that equipment, if there's any change outs, if there's any replacement of that equipment, we will, that, re that results in a reduction in energy consumption, that is what we will incentivize for. And uh, with that said, what I'd like to do is uh, hand it over to my colleague, who also works within the, the Energy Efficiency Group with a slightly different role. Can I just ask, as you're training here, um, I have Central Hudson also in my district and, and NYSIC. Uh, do, do all the utility companies have programs like yours, or are you unique? Do you know? I can't speak for NYSIC or any other utilities. I know that it's not uncommon. But I also know that Con Edison is one of the more progressive utilities in that regard. Okay, maybe because you're in New York City. Um, I don't, maybe it's because New York State, like California, has greater, has imposed greater mandates. Um, oh, another thing, and this is uh, in, in reference to something that was discussed earlier. In April, there were a set of laws passed in New York, uh, generally referred to as the Climate Mobilization Act. But uh, one law is uh, referred to as a local law in 97. Beginning in 2023, uh, buildings that do not maintain or reach a certain level of uh, CO2, um, CO2 reduction are going to get penalized. They're going to have a financial penalty imposed upon them beginning in 2023. It's going to significantly get ramped up starting in 2030. So, it's now, all these buildings in Manhattan, and it, it, that law applies to buildings greater than 20,000 square feet, and that amounts to about 50,000 um, buildings within New York. So we're talking about, as you walk down the streets of Midtown Manhattan, every building you look up at is a building that's going to be fine if they don't achieve these goals. So energy efficiency projects are a key method for them to to do that, to reduce their energy usage. There are other means by which they can achieve those uh, those carbon uh, reduction targets or obtain those targets, but um, energy efficiency is certainly one of the one of the easier ways to go about doing it. And we incentivize on the commercial industrial side, but as has been discussed quite a bit tonight, uh, there are incentives available for multifamily buildings. There are incentives available for small businesses, and there are incentives available for homeowners. Okay, Adam, a minute? Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, I am familiar with the Central Hudson rebates. Central Hudson does have additional rebates, uh, same thing as Con Edison. Uh, it's just they're laid out a little bit differently. So every utility pretty much has a website, and you can just get steered uh, when you go there to look for their energy management, energy savings and you can get additional information based on that. Uh, more focused on my particular role with Con Ed, uh, I work with a group called Non-Pipeline Solutions, and we were established to kind of facilitate the electrification or bringing on heat pumps uh, with NYSERDA. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we'll be taking over those rebates uh, in the second quarter of uh, next year. Uh, so there's more to come with that starting next year, uh, but in the interim, we are basically 
our group initially is doing enhancements on the energy uh, efficiency portfolio. So we do have weatherization contractors, we do have ground source uh, contractors working with us. Uh, so we can elaborate more on that. Uh, just feel free, we'll be here for a few extra minutes after this and we can talk to you more about that. Um, and there's going to be a lot more focus on heat pumps and electrification moving forward. So uh, please be aware and uh, look for additional rebates. Thank you. Should we and answer our questions or? Yeah, do you or pass? I do have a question. Yeah. With all this emphasis on electricity as a power source above and beyond others, what are we going to do about the grid? I don't think anybody can hear you. Exactly. Why don't you stand I, up? I, I can repeat the question. Okay. Uh, so the question uh, was more focused on with these additional energy efficiencies and, and basically what about the grid, right? Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure some of the other folks could probably answer that as well, but the grid is being looked at as well. Uh, there are going to be probably, I'm um, sure, some build-outs of that as well. I know we are continuing upgrading our grid especially in Westchester alone, especially with all the recent storms. Anytime something does like that occur, we're always doing continual home and maintenance and capital improvements. Also, there's, okay. uh, there are programs that are becoming much more popular to reduce peak demand, and the utility pays customers to reduce their peak demand on demand. So it's called the demand response program. So one of the big trends now is a movement toward control systems in buildings. These lights, I don't see, I don't think I see a control system for these lights, but kind of this incentivizes for equipment, for lighting to be put on control systems. Uh, the control systems to be integrated to building management systems or building automation systems. And what being on those control systems allows a building to do is it allows that building to be on a demand response program with the utility. So if the utility calls them up during a peak demand day, particularly a hot summer day, say, and says, we need you to reduce your consumption, your load, tomorrow between these hours, all that building has to do is go to their control system and reduce their lights from 80% to 60%, or shut off one of their air handler units on the roof or something like that, right? So that is, a key way that the utility could help reduce the demand levels, which helps reduce the strain on the system. I'm going to thank you, all of, all of the speakers. Oh, we have one more. One more. Yep, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Tell us where you're from. Yes, hi, I'm Kathy Golubuski. I'm with Sustainable Westchester. I'm also a 25 year resident of Portland Manor. Um, Sustainable Westchester is also a nonprofit. It's a consortium of almost all the municipalities in Westchester County, except for two, and also um, the county itself is a member. And we work with them to promote and create different sustainable programs. Many of them you've heard about through the other organizations. You've heard our name from Nysurda several times. Um, we have five main focus programs. Uh, the Heat Smart program you heard about from NYSERDA. Um, it is a community based, but we also um, will um, have information for just all the residents in, in the county. And we also have a commercial Heat Smart program, very active now, um, going along with you know, what Conrad was talking about. Um, the uh, Clean Transportation Program works closely with it for Electrify New York. And we also have um, an individual program with Nissan New Rochelle. You can get a discount off a Nissan Leaf. Um, so you get a really good deal on an electric vehicle. Um, we were talking about solar. Right now we're concentrating on community solar. We talked about the solar farms. And many of the projects we have now are on buildings where we're not using, you know, land is not being used. And it's, there's information at the table. It's, it's a guaranteed savings off your electric bill if you're not a candidate for solar or, you know, don't want solar or live in an apartment or a condo. 
Uh, the other program we have is waste reduction and recycling, zero waste, which you know we talked about recycling. It's really important um, to continue to do that. And right now, there's a couple of uh, uh, programs going on in schools to teach students how to recycle properly. So, you know, do it improperly and mess it up. And the other, one of our biggest programs is the Westchester Power Program. That's our energy program. There are 27 municipalities in the program. And it's an aggregation where we go out and purchase electric supply in bulk at a fixed rate. And out of the 27 municipalities, 24 are in the renewable supply option. So whatever th those kilowatt hours use, that amount of energy is backed 100% by New York State Hydropower. It's also a program if a municipality belongs, it goes towards their uh, climate smart um, certification. So, you know, that's really important too. Um, I have all the information back on the table if you're interested in any specific program. Thank you so much. And uh, we've had different groups here in Westchester and Putnam. We have the Hudson Highlands Land Trustees were co-sponsors of the event, T-Town, um, Federated Conservationists of Westchester, Hudson Valley Community Program, Power Program, Riverkeepers, Sierra Club, Putnam County Land Trust, um, Citizens Climate Lobby, and the Curtin Conservat um, Conservatory Advisory Council. And I just really like to thank our speakers, Shandu, Mark, Connor, uh, Dobbin, there are a lot more questions, but go back and talk with everybody. I want to thank my staff for doing a fantastic job of putting all this together. Um, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.